Uh, I have a guest in a couple of guests in town, uh, Jordan and Vern from Blue Water Mission in Hawaii. Vern uh, runs their justice ministry, although she's not speaking this morning. If you have a heart for justice, I encourage you to run to the front and accost her after the service and ask her every question that you might have. She has more stories than almost anyone I can possibly think of. She runs a residential recovery kind of transition ministry for uh, women coming out of human trafficking. So if you have like any, not all of you are at the conference, if that's even on your radar, there's a very unusual resource in the room and you will have to take the initiative. So that's just a heads up. I just encourage you to be bold in your initiative. Um, Jordan's uh, friend we've known for a number of years, author of Miracle Work. I believe there are two copies of Miracle Work outside that didn't sell this weekend. So also on the initiative and if you want one, you must run and beat other people out uh, to get it, but there are two. It's also on Amazon. Um, well, there's a lot we love about Jordan and Sonia and uh, their just uh, stories and friendship over the years, but uh, one thing I want to highlight is he's really fearless in doing what the Lord says, just, just not afraid. And we need more of that in this world, fearless followers of Jesus. Please Give a really warm welcome for uh, Jordan Singh. Aloha. 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 How y'all doing? Good. Can we start with some prophetic ministry? Uh, I'll call up my uh, compatriot here, Vern. Veronica, everybody calls her Vern. And uh, we'll just, uh, yeah, we don't know most of you. And so if uh, we give you a message, a uh, prophetic message that turns out to be accurate, obviously it's from the Lord because we wouldn't, need, we wouldn't know enough to make it up. Uh, ladies first, do you want to start one? Sure. Go. So you are, if you're not familiar with uh, prophetic ministry, it's just, you know, the Lord will give some revealed information to someone and they will share it with uh, the, the intended recipient. And if you find it accurate and helpful, great. If you don't, throw it in the garbage can on your way out. But we find that the Lord manages to bless a lot of people this way. Now you can go. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, so let's see. I will start with, there's a lady a few rows back here. You just looked up at me. You have a blank black tank top on and your black and white headband. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you. Um, so Could you stand up? Because I don't see you. No, cannot stand up. Okay, or can't. Uh, it's up to you. Um, <laughs> but I felt like um, oh, that the Lord uh, spoke to me that he wanted to restore your joy through uh, healing of a specific health issue. And I uh, felt like... And, tell me if this is accurate or not, but I felt like that maybe there was something with your digestion system in that it wasn't absorbing and taking in the nutrients as it should be. And I don't know if that relates. No, not really for you. Oh, oh it does, it, it does relate. Upon, upon consultation. <laughs> okay, well, you were the first one that I felt like that the Lord pointed out to me, and he, what is it? Gluten. Gluten. Exactly. Oh, okay. okay. Well, okay. Well, that uh, relates to me in an interesting way, but that's a different story. Uh, yeah, is it celiac or is it uh, a strong sensitivity? Strong sensitivity. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Can... Can I heal it? Right now? Just yeah. heal it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I just speak healing and balance into your body right now in the name of Jesus, and I speak to your digestive system and tell it to calm down and to recognize nutrition uh, now in the name of Jesus and anything that has set this uh, system off in an improper way of attacking food. Uh, that should be healthy. I just uh, rebuke that now in the name of Jesus, the confusion inside her digestion uh, system. I rebuke it now in the name of Jesus and tell it to come into the order of God now. Uh, I speak healing and soothing, no more inflammation. Uh, 
Yeah, no more inflammation now in Jesus' name. And body, I just tell you to be well. Be well in Jesus' name. Be of the order of the kingdom of God, that food was created by God for your nourishment. And I just uh, rebuke um, the disorder inside the digestive system now. Yeah, my daughter was born with a gluten sensitivity and now eats bread just fine. So anyway, hopefully that passes on. You want to do one or you want to do more? Can I, I'll do some quick hits. Uh, I just want to say why I'm thinking of it to is Patrick, right? The guy who just shared. Like every time, every time I see you, this is the Lord mm-hmm. impresses upon me that you have a gift of healing and, and, and you ought to be healing a lot of people all the time. And so I just want to make a point to say that in front of the church so that you're constantly kicking his butt. Like, every, every sick person. But your healing will operate best on the streets. Uh, it's just, you know, a lovely way of evangelism. And I think as you do healing on the streets and places outside the walls of the church, that you'll be ten times more effective. Um, and so you just have to do that. It's like a call. It, not everybody can do that really well. And uh, so you should, because you can, but also it's just how the Lord is moving in your life. So, so, uh, so make... No mistake. Um, just as I'm speaking, the Lord's giving me a number that I don't understand. It's 480, 480. I think it might be an address. Um, I'm sorry, this is fly by the seat of my pants. But anyway, <laughs> if you uh, just remember that. Just remember that. Um, the, the fellow that was just at the sound booth, you, right? In the back? Yes, you? Uh, could you stand for a second? Well, I just have to stand. This will be really quick. Are, are you leading a, a home group or a small group or something like that? Okay, you should. <laughs> and, and, and I think then um, you do that, and with a short amount of time, what you'll do is that you'll create three or four. Um, so uh, so your, your fellowship will read fellowship. Mm-hmm. And in your, in, in your home, your marriage, yeah? Is, is this your lovely wife? Um, so, like, together even, you're, you're greater than the sum of your parts. Um, so just, there's just a lovely gift of hospitality and energizing in your home. You have a child? Plenty of free time then? <laughs> right? There's no sweat? Uh, but, but if you would just do that, I think it would be tremendously fruitful. And then you just have in your mind... Uh, I'm always empowering other people to do this as well. And that would be a, a great stream for you to move in. The yeah, can I do one more? You're okay, going to do go one ahead, more. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the lady with the plaid shirt, and I met you outside. You told me your name, but I forgot. And you have on boots. Yeah, can you, what is it? Lena. Lena, yeah. Can, Lena, can you stand up? Um, so I felt like uh, that uh, God spoke about that there was a, a promise of a uh, legacy of influence over somebody, and then he highlighted you to me during um, worship time. And so I don't know if you're influencing uh, people, but you should be, and that there will be generational uh, growth and influence from that. So what I saw was a picture of a rainbow, and that, of course, made me think of promise. And then he highlighted to me uh, Noah's legacy that went forth in the in the earth. And so I feel like that you have a um, powerful spirit about you to influence others and that they then become influencers. So I don't know if you're involved in things or Be not. Be more specific. Who is she going to influence? Who is she going to influence? Um, hmm. It has the feeling of like a small group or a home group, whatever you guys call it, but it's a little bit more edgier than that. So I feel like that um, it, it's more on new believers or uh, going out and gathering some new believers and then influencing them to live their life uh, after God and after the kingdom. And uh, generationally, they will have influence through their family and their family line is what I felt specifically. I, uh, I see a lot of pioneer and frontiers imagery with you, so I just say, uh, like, in your family, you are the first to do certain things, and I just think that that is a gift that you can pass on to others as well. It's like, look, I, 
I didn't have a model. I was the first, and it worked out fine. Let me bless you. You can do it as well. And you're a, you're a frontierswoman, and that is always precious. Mm -hmm. uh, one other thing, the lady in white here in the second row that's cleaning her sunglasses. Um, <laughs> I, oh, I, I uh, saw you and immediately felt like that you had a gift of hospitality and that you should be uh, welcoming people in some sort of gathering involving food and uh, like maybe having like a dinner night or something like that and bringing people in. And I think that would be uh, uh, influential for the growth of the church also, of just making new people feel welcomed. Uh, you have that ability. Are you done? Cam. Okay. <laughs> Probably has some more, but she will, she will chase you down. And could do a couple more, but I just do one because it's kind of fun. You there, uh, the light hair and the green striped shirt? No. Male or woman? Male. No, no. Actually, behind you, sir. There you go. Ah, you're the guy. Um, <laughs> I asked you earlier, and the Lord said, clubber, clubber like, you know, a nightclubber, but you don't strike me as a nightclub person. Um, you never know. Um, but I think uh, the, uh, basically what the Lord is saying is that a good evangelistic milieu for you would be like in, in, your, in your clubs, your clubs. Like, are you in a club? And uh, what kind of, is it? Do you mind me asking? Uh, we design rocket engines. The club that designs rocket engines? Yeah. It's like, it's, I see explosive evangelism. No, wait, evangelism unto explosions. I don't know. I'm not sure, but um, anyway, so that's just a, that's a place where you want to evangelize and just do it by sort of, uh, I like to do it just by asking provocative questions. And there are people at the conference that will suggest a few to you, but uh, please do that and then you know, before too long, you'll have you seriously influenced and changed the life of a couple of friends, okay? Just wanted to, that was just a fun word, clubber. I think, I think thus a nickname is born. <laughs> clubber. Or maybe Rocket Man. Uh, we're talking this weekend uh, about uh, life in the kingdom, life in the kingdom of God. That's what our little uh, conference uh, retreat was on. And... Uh, the kingdom of God is what gets me out of bed in the morning. I just think it's a wonderful place to be, the kingdom of God, and it's a, it's a wonderful uh, way to live. Um, I like to introduce myself by telling kingdom stories uh, from recent life, uh, from my, my faith community. Uh, Vern reminded me of one last night as we were hanging out, uh, chatting with some people. It happened uh, not too long ago. I don't think I've told this story. Yeah, it's been a while since I've been here, so... Probably not. Uh, there was, uh, we have a community house that sort of specializes in just you know, taking homeless and addicted people off the street and uh, just introducing them to loving community and the power of the Lord. And uh, the guy who runs it, the name is John, and he had befriended this uh, homeless woman who had been homeless in Honolulu for years uh, and uh, befriended her gradually and then eventually convinced her to come live in the house with them uh, because she didn't, she didn't look too well. She was suffering physically, uh, it was clear. It turned out that she was quite sick, unbeknownst to anybody. Uh, she had cancer in her spine and she was not long for the earth. Um, and then one Christmas week, um, her name was, was Meredith, uh, she said to John uh, as he came home from a party and was on his way to the airport one night to go see his family for Christmas, she said, John... Uh, would you help me contact my son? I'd like to talk to him uh, this Christmas. Uh, and John said, sure, uh, what's his name? And so she said the name, um, you know, I won't give it, but a very, very common name, like Mike Brown, you know, very common name. And John said, great, uh, what's his email or what's his address? And she says, I don't know. It turns out they'd had no contact for 28 years uh, because Meredith had, uh, had become mentally ill and just disappeared from her house one day, and her family didn't know where she was, and she had no contact with them uh, for 28 years. But she's looking at John, hopefully, like, now I want to contact him, so do something. Uh, I said, well, what do you know about him? Where, where does he live? And all she could say was, well, when last I saw him, he was in California. Um, and uh, I think he has something to do with the legal profession. 
And those were his two clues. So John, heading to the airport, right, sits down in his laptop over the number, goes to Google and types in Mike Brown, legal, California, something like that. And I did the, I did the search with him once because I was curious. I typed in the same terms, and there were like 6.2 billion returns. <laughs> and so John just like starts scrolling through pages, like how in the world, you know, it's random information about the Mike Browns of the world. And he sees a link that sort of catches his eye, and he clicks on it, and the guy has, ends up, he has a Gmail, has a Google email, and there's a little picture of him yet, like profile picture, and John looks at the guy and says, well, I guess he could be related to Meredith. They look a little bit of light. And there was contact information for this guy's business. He was in a legal profession. So John sends this fellow an email randomly. Hi, my name is John. If you've been missing your mother for 28 years, I have her. Uh, we're in Honolulu. Merry Christmas. Uh, and then he goes to the airport, gets on the plane, flies to his family home on the mainland, and opens his laptop on Christmas Eve. When he gets there, there's an email response. It is her son, one out of 6.2 billion. First try, only try. Anyway, long story short, he flies to Honolulu and holds his mom in the last week of her life. They have a, a reunion. Uh, and then uh, flies home. She dies you know, within a couple days after his departure. He, he comes back for the funeral which John held uh, at the Capitol building, basically downtown in, in Honolulu, because all the homeless community knew her and came to celebrate, and her son speaks at her funeral. There's just something about that that screams kingdom of God to me, right? A tremendously chaotic, broken situation uh, to which the Lord brings heavenly order, you know, which looks like restoration. Um, and you just see stuff like that all the time uh, when you live and move uh, in the kingdom of God. The kingdom, uh, more than anything else, is an order. In fact, it kinda, it's kind of what it means, kingdom, king's dominion, king's control. It's the order of the king. Um, it's the order of heaven. Um, there's no sickness in heaven, so when we who move in the kingdom encounter sickness on earth, we heal it. So we try. Um, there is no demonic oppression in heaven, so when we who move in the kingdom find demons oppressing people on earth, we cast them out. There's no poverty in heaven, so when we who move in the kingdom encounter poverty or injustice on earth, we make it right. We provide for people, even if we have to do it miraculously, making a, a meal for thousands out of five loaves and two fishes. You know, we're always bringing the order of heaven to earth. That's what we do. Now, Jesus' life made clear that the kingdom is uh, the message he showed up, and when he started preaching, it's, the, his first message was, the kingdom of God is here. That's the good news, right? The good news, technically, in Scripture, is called the good news of the kingdom, or the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of God's order. And there's a lot of wonderful aspects of God or, God's order, one being that God is not angry and distant, God is present. God really isn't hung up on your sin. You know, God's not fussy, he's not worried about getting dirty, and he proved that by coming to earth, actually putting on dirty flesh, finally the most reprehensible people that he could, and hugging them, and, 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 and spending time with them. God is not standoffish or judgmental in the least. You know, sin is bad, it's destructive, but it doesn't keep God from you. Now, it may keep you from God, but that's different. <laughs> it may drag you away from him. But, you know, he's, it's a generous order, it's a restorative order, it's a healing order. It's a wonderful good news sort of message. But we who, who follow Jesus need to preach the kingdom, right? We don't just preach heaven, we preach the order of heaven. And that's kind of what we were talking about this weekend. Uh, at, at, the, at the conference, uh, Jesus announces his kingdom message by saying, the Lord has anointed me to preach good news uh, to the poor, the press, the, prison, the prisoners, he said, to, to uh, give sight to the blind, he said. You sort of go through his announcement, and we were talking about the four ordering principles of the kingdom of heaven. Radical grace is the first one. I've already talked about that. God is way more generous with you than you think he is. It's really hard to offend God. You know, grace, radical grace, is actually what got Jesus killed. Who killed Jesus? The religious people, right? Why? Because they could not imagine that he was truly from God, and yet he was powerful, so it made them mad. 
Uh, and so they killed him to save God's reputation. Right? And that's a fair summary of, of why Jesus was killed on the cross. Grace got Jesus killed. Grace is the hardest concept in the world to get your brain around because it's so otherworldly. God is just way more generous than you think. Um, justice or you know, anti-materialism, sort of material restoration is a principle. Jesus always prioritized the poor, the least, the most oppressed because uh, deprivation is out of order. It's upside down. In the kingdom of God, there's always plenty. More than anything else, Jesus talked about money and wealth. And in that context, more than anything else, he said, don't worry about money. Ever. But money is usually the Lord of our lives. It determines where we live because of our job, who we hang out with, how we live, and all that stuff. And, and we're all money sick. But if we move in the kingdom of God, we get healed from that, and we become money free. How many of you are money free? <laughs> Three bold people. Yes, all right. Um, but we talked about justice and really bringing healing to uh, deprived people um, everywhere. Supernaturalism is one of the ordering principles of the kingdom of God. We just did a little fun exercise there, Hear, healing, hearing supernaturally from God. Uh, God is a chatty fellow. Um, he's always talking, and if he's always talking, it's rude not to listen. So we make a point to listen and then to share what we think uh, we hear. Uh, that sort of supernatural leading from the Lord uh, will shape your life if you give God half a chance. But there's also healing. We should do some healing this morning as well. Well, there was the gluten thing, healing. Um, but let's do some more. That's always fun. Patrick, do some. <laughs> more than anything else, if you move in the kingdom of God, you have a mission-oriented life. Life is ministry. That's what you're doing on earth. You are bringing the order of heaven to people. You're not imposing a kingdom, but you're bringing a kingdom and inviting people to enter into it. Jesus is obsessive about this thing that he calls fruitfulness. You must have a fruitful life. What is fruit? Fruit is the, the reproductive vessel of the plant. He describes it in terms of vine, branches, fruit. It's like, you must produce reproduction. You must produce other lives restored to the Lord. And if you don't, Jesus says in no uncertain terms, then you're pointless. And the worst thing in the world is to have a pointless life. It's terrible. It's terrible. You have a messy life, but you cannot have a pointless one. Um, um, so uh, that really needs to... Uh, to dominate our priorities, we really need to influence people toward God and kingdom restoration. I'll say more about that, uh, but, but there you go. Uh, the kingdom is an order of things, and we try to move in that order and to bring that order. Um, there's a lot in, in that phrase when I say it like that. If you're going to bring the kingdom of God to the world, then you need to really have the kingdom of God within yourself. Uh, Jesus said the kingdom of God uh, is within. This applied even to Jesus. You notice that before he started his public kingdom ministry, he spent some time really getting things in order in, in himself. After he was filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit, his baptism, the first thing he did is that he was led by the Spirit. In other words, he followed supernatural leading into the wilderness, right? Where he did exercises of getting things in order. Satan came and tempted him with all manner of temptations, and Jesus chose obedience instead. Nope, nope, that's not what I do. He, it's, he fasted for 40 days, which sort of put the spiritual over the physical, uh, which is the proper order of things, you know, and he exercised that hard. It's hard not to eat for 40 days. And it says in the scripture, at the end of that time, he was hungry, which is the great understatement of the opening chapters of the gospel. And Satan comes to him and said, well, look, you have miracle working power, make some bread. Make some bread out of these stones. And Jesus did an exercise of order there. He said, no, 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 man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. In other words, I don't provide for myself in the kingdom of God. I let God provide for me, and I follow his lead. In other words, proper order, proper order. Satan was basically saying, restore yourself, comfort yourself, rest yourself. And Jesus was like, no, I'm going I'm to wait for God. I'm going to wait for God. 
It's an ordering exercise. And then it says, as he returned from the wilderness, he returned to Galilee in power. He had the presence of God at his baptism, but after his ordering, he had the power of God flowing through him, and he was able to bring the kingdom of God, the order of the kingdom to the world. And so he healed people and restored people and, and uh, provided for people. If we are moving and living in the kingdom, that's the kind of life that we have. Snap your fingers if you're into that sort of life. If your life is mission-oriented, if you're really doing ministry, if you're like, you know, for instance, going to uh, people in great deprivation or going to the people who are suffering the most and sacrificing your life for them, even if you're doing a lot of activity in the church, you find that it's a fairly full life. Can I get an amen? In fact, even if you're not involved with ministry, not involved in a church these days, you are probably too busy. Can I get an amen? It's nuts. How many of you are too crowded in your lives? How many of you are scared to raise your hands? Just let me see. Right. All right. I like audience participation because if there's one thing that's true about me, it's that I'm very extroverted and interactive. Not, not in the least, but you can help me out, right? Is your life too busy or not? Yeah. It's way too busy. And, and, and now, you know, some skinny guy from Hawaii comes and says to you, ah, you know, you have to really prioritize ministry. You have to really throw yourself at kingdom living, which is otherworldly and unusual and effortful. And one of the most common things that I hear among people who are following hard after Jesus is, I'm tired. I'm tired. In fact, it's one of the things that I say uh, to God uh, most often in, in my prayers. One of the things I, I, I used to say, it's just, it's just a, a tiring life. I'm coming off of uh, a two-year period that has just been utterly exhausting uh, to me. Uh, I, I've received some comments uh, from, from some of you, because last time I spoke at this church was about two years ago, I think, and I was 20 pounds heavier at the time. You know, I'm, I'm one of those guys where when it gets really stressful and exhausting, I don't, I don't eat too much and gain weight. I just like forget to eat and don't exercise and lose weight. So I've dropped, you know, 20 pounds. So, you know, the kingdom of God has taken its pound of flesh from me. Uh, my church opened a justice restaurant a couple years ago. Um, we were, uh, we had these uh, these women and girls coming out of human trafficking and coming through our safe house. We had these homeless people and formerly addicted people coming through our community house. And we found that we could not really find them good jobs. And so social, socioeconomically, they were not getting fully rehabilitated and engaged. And we sort of felt the Lord say, well, you provide them a job. And we got this idea for a justice restaurant. Uh, you know, restaurants are hard to run anyway, and 90% of them fail. And then we're basically starting and running a restaurant with people who, by definition, are unemployable. We did not think this through, perhaps as well as we might, but we were trying to follow the lead of the Lord. So we started this restaurant with great fanfare, and there was a lot of favor on it. But then, predictably, the people who were running it and leading it, they sort of bottomed out. They cracked up. They were, anyway, I found myself working 50 or 60 hours a week at the restaurant and then 40 or 50 hours a week at, at the church running those things because ostensibly I'm the senior pastor. Well, the senior pastors don't really do anything, but you have to look busy. <laughs> and so I was working 90, 100-hour weeks for 12 or 14 months with, you know, two uh, kids at home and you know, stuff like that. And that's why I lost uh, 20 pounds. Uh, I very rarely slept. Uh, there was one uh, stretch of two weeks where I worked every shift at the restaurant, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and ran the church and preached on Sundays. And that seemed very out of order to me. But it was, a, you know, it was a crisis and an emergency. I don't think I was being sinful. I think I was being sacrificial. And you can do that for a little while, right? Um, I have been blessed with, I think, just an almost supernatural amount of stamina. That's one of my gifts in life. But that was, that was crazy. Uh, that was crazy. Uh, the last six months have, have been a little bit better. As, as things have, have stabilized. And, you know, just generally, this kingdom life is... is stretching, you know, like a lot of people who do ministry as a vocation, 
Um, the Lord always provides for me financially, but month to month, I don't know how he's going to provide for me financially. Can I get an amen? Um, and so it's always surprising in a wonderful sort of way, but there's always sort of a, a burden of, well, how do we plan? What can we do? There's this sort of uncertainty, which makes space for faith, which is nice, but you find yourself always lean, you know, always, always stretched. It takes a little bit. It takes a little bit of work, doesn't it? Um, arguably, the busiest person uh, at my church is sitting right here, uh, Veronica, who runs uh, a rehabilitation house for survivors of uh, human sex trafficking. Just imagine what that is like. Now, imagine that you're doing that uh, with a two-year-old. Now, imagine that you're doing that with a two-year-old and working full-time during the day. Uh, that's her life, and it's fairly full. Yes, okay. Um, we find ourselves uh, doing that, and, and what I do is I, you know, I, I pour through Scripture looking for all the places that mention rest. <laughs> I like the parable of the sheep and the goats where Jesus is talking about the end of days and you know, the people that, that live in the kingdom and follow Jesus uh, well, that know Jesus well, they get, they get a reward at the end, and, and the way it's phrased there... Uh, we hear the Father say, uh, well done, faithful servant, enter into my rest. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what I want to hear from God. It's like, vacation time, oh, thank God. Yes? You hear that? Who, how many of you could use a break? It's hard. No, it's unusual, it's otherworldly that the kingdom life should be sustainable. How do you make the kingdom life sustainable uh, is, is, is the great question. And, you know, there are some differences between kingdom rest and what I call worldly rest. Here's one way I would phrase it, and then I'll just spend, you know, uh, 15 minutes talking about this, and uh, hopefully it will bless someone. In, in, in worldly life, you rest when you're tired or when the work is done both of which make a lot of sense, right? I'm really, really tired, I'm going to rest. Or, well, job's finished, now I can rest. And that's how most of us think, and that's really intuitive. In kingdom life, you rest out of obedience, which isn't necessarily in conflict with the first one, but it is different, right? So just think about that a second. Um, one of the very first major commands the people of God get in the Bible, in fact, it's as God is beginning to develop a people. It's in our kindergarten phase. Uh, he gives us the Ten Commandments. And, of course, one of the big ten is remember the Sabbath. Remember the day of rest. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Set aside a day of the week for me. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy unto the Lord. You're not going to do any work on that day and you just kind of focus on the Lord. Take a break. It is one of the big ten commandments. Take a break. Take it easy once a week. What is most curious to me about the Sabbath commandment is that God should have to make it one of the big ten. The others I kind of understand. But why does God have to order us to take it easy? There's something about human nature, there's something about life that requires God to command rest. Or there's something about life with God that commands him, that requires him to command rest. It's like we don't do it naturally, although it, it seems like it should be the most natural thing in the world to take it easy, right? Well, I think it's because in the, in the world, in worldly life, things seem really scarce. And that is a curse that we humans have wrestled with since the beginning of time. We have to work to get by, and you know, if we work extra hard, we think then we'll get by better, but somehow it just gets all convoluted and complicated such that the Lord has to command us to stop it. You know, once a week, stop it. Take it easy. People um, ask uh, from time to time, when I talk about kingdom living and kingdom ministry and what we do as a church, well, how, uh, how do you find balance in life? 
you know, with everything that you do, with everything that you feel responsible for? How do you find a balance? And my response is, oh, in the kingdom of God, you don't find balance? That's crazy. Read the story of Jesus' life in the Gospels. Did he seem like a balanced man to you? No! Are you kidding me? He lived like a homeless beggar, you know, traveling around with a bunch of uh, strange people. And, you know, his work was exhausting. It says sometimes he didn't have time to sit and eat because the crowds were pestering him so much. He had to run away from them to get any time by himself. He had to get up before dawn uh, to find time to pray, which meant he hardly slept uh, in terms of his regular schedule, right? And, you know, just, just to put a point on it, his life did get him killed. Um, so balance, no, it wasn't balance. But do you think Jesus operated in rest? That's, that's a different question. And, and I think the answer has to be uh, yes. So I, so I read Jesus' teachings on the Sabbath. I gone through and I read everything that he says about, about the Sabbath. And you know what he says about the Sabbath? Every time he addresses the Sabbath, he's talking about why it's okay to work on the Sabbath. Every, every time. Right? If you think about it, go through and check them out. Right? A lot of times he gets accused. He, get, he, he, he makes the religious people mad because he does healings on the Sabbath. That was a huge issue. It's like, how dare you do ministry on, on the Sabbath day? I tend to agree with them. But, um, but he, you know, he healed, well, there, there, there are a ton of them. Uh, he healed the man with the shriveled hand on the Sabbath. And the religious people got mad at him. Hey, you could do that work on six days. Uh, and and that, that's the occasion on which he gave his famous, well, if your sheep or your ox falls into a ditch, are you not going to take him out of the ditch on the Sabbath, even though technically that's work? It's like, look, sometimes there are emergencies. And a suffering human being is an emergency. So, of course, I'm going to do it, uh, even though it's the Sabbath. The woman with the twisted spine in Luke 13, he healed her on the Sabbath and then rebuked the religious people and said, this is a daughter of Abraham who deserves respect and dignity. Of course, I'm going to take care of her uh, on the Sabbath. Uh, there's a man with abnormal swelling. He healed on the Sabbath. The crippled man in John 5. There's the blind man that was in John chapter 9. Gets healed on the Sabbath. And, and the religious officials drag him in front of court, remember, and make him testify. Who healed you on the Sabbath? Clearly this man could not be from God. And the blind man said, uh, he healed me, so you figure it out. Uh, seemed like a godly thing to me. Uh, that's, a great, that's a great story. You wonder if Jesus ever took a, a Sabbath day of, ever took the Sabbath off. It doesn't seem so. Once on the Sabbath, he and his disciples were walking through grain fields, and his disciples were picking grain because they were hungry. But picking grain is technically harvesting, which is technically work, so the religious people got mad. How dare your disciples pick grain on the Sabbath? Can't they do that on the other six days? You call yourself a godly rabbi. Ha! Busted. And... Jesus had some choice words uh, for them. Occasionally in Scripture, you see Jesus try to get away alone with his disciples in order to take a break. He tries to run to the north country once. He tries to cross the lake uh, to, uh, to get a break, to go to the land of the Gerasenes in order to take a vacation. But every time Jesus tries to get away, take a, take a vacation, he runs into uh, a man with a legion of demons or a Syrophoenician woman uh, that is begging uh, for attention. And it never really works out for him. I just want to read one short piece of scripture this morning uh, in that context. It's from Mark chapter 4. And maybe this is a familiar story uh, for a lot of you. The scripture for today is Mark 4, 31 through, excuse me, 35 through 41. There are other versions of this story in scripture as well. Usually in your Bibles, uh, it, it is titled something like, Jesus Calms the Storm. Uh, so what's happening here is that Jesus has been teaching on the kingdom of God and healing a lot of people, and there are tremendous crowds pressing on him 24-7. And so he's getting sort of tired of that, and so he's going to try to get away with his disciples to take it easy. And that day, when evening came, it says in verse 35, he said to his disciples, hey, let's go over to the other side. And basically he's saying, hey, how about we, how about we just get away and, and chill out together? And I imagine they say, good idea, Jesus. Leaving the crowd behind, uh, they took him along just as he was in the boat. So they stick Jesus in a boat. Remember, these guys are largely fishermen. They get a boat. 
And Jesus said, Jesus, we got this. You sit in the back, and we'll row across the lake, and we'll get some R&R. Uh, there were also other boats with him. People are trying to follow him. So I imagine the guys were trying to row really fast. Then a furious, furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Well, there goes the vacation. This furious, furious squall. That lake was actually famous for its squalls. And the waves were breaking over the boat, probably a little, little fishing boat, a rowboat, essentially, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, in the back of the boat, sleeping on a cushion. Any sailors in here? Any small boat sailors? I love to sail. I sail all the time. Have you ever tried to sleep during a furious, furious storm? Anyone? In a small boat? A small open boat with the waves crashing over you? Very interesting that he should sleep through this. So the disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? We're dying here. So how bad was this storm that seasoned fishermen were freaking out? It was a really bad storm. And, and they wake up Jesus because, you know, he's so unconcerned that they're all about to die. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? A fantastically curious thing to say, given the circumstances. They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Uh, a, a few points I just want to draw out of that really quickly. Point number one, Jesus got very tired. I mean, sleeping in the stern of a little boat during a furious squall, he must have really been exhausted. I mean, it wasn't so much sleeping as passing out at that point. That was the sort of schedule that this fellow kept. Jesus got tired. And so I probably will get tired as well. You probably will get tired as well. Um, the, fact, the second thing is that Jesus could sleep in the most furious of storms. And what does that, what does that require? He, says, he basically says what it requires when he wakes up. He says, don't be afraid, have faith. He had enough faith to rest in a life-threatening situation. That tells me a lot about kingdom rest. More than that, he gets up and he calms this storm. He has power over it which tells me in the kingdom life, you will have power over any circumstance in which you can truly rest. One of the keys to being a powerful person is being able to rest at any time, in any situation, no matter what, even if you or your close friends are about to die. Think about that for a second. That's otherworldly. And whenever I encounter something otherworldly, I think, huh, kingdom the order of heaven, not the order of the world. You have power over any circumstance in which you can truly rest. How do you keep the kingdom life sustainable? All right, well, let's just end with a few bullet points, a few tips. Uh, number one, um, I think Jesus teaches us to resist temptations born of fatigue. In fact, that's kind of the first thing we see Jesus do in his kingdom ministry, right? Before he starts his public ministry, he goes off into the wilderness, and what happens there? He basically exhausts himself intentionally. He puts himself way out in a lonely place, in rugged circumstances. He goes without food, and Satan comes and tempts him with all of these gnarly sins. You might, you ever been beaten down? Do you not get vulnerable to sin at that point? Why? Well, because, you know, we don't like the sense of fatigue. We don't like the sense of isolation. And, and fatigue always makes you feel alone, even if you're crowded with people. Fatigue always makes you feel alone and abandoned. And Satan invariably, or bad habits invariably, come to us and say, this is unacceptable 
what are you going to do about it? You have the ability to eat some bread, to indulge in some comforts. Hey, there's nothing wrong with this particular indulgence, but you know, you know how it is, right? Satan tempts you to sin. It started with get some bread and it sort of ended with, why don't you worship me and I'll make this all work out for you. It'll be a lot easier. You won't have to go through all of these motions, which Jesus knew would end with his grisly death. You get tired and, and, and sin gets you, doesn't it? You start providing for yourself. That's one of the great temptations of life in the kingdom because it's so hard and effortful. Uh, we get tired and we're tempted to just you know, indulge in some, well, they're not restful things. They're distractions and escapes. Distraction and escape are poor substitutes for rest. You can tell that you're not resting well when you have the sense that you have to escape from your life. You know what I mean? I think you know what I mean. When you fantasize about escaping, <laughs> nervous laughter, nervous laughter. <laughs> it's like, yeah, maybe, maybe, we should just, maybe we should just move to Hawaii. Take it from me. Hawaii can be very busy for kingdom-minded people. Um, that, that's actually the first thing that, that Jesus uh, conquers. When, when you start fantasizing about escape, uh, it's because you don't rest well. There's a world of difference between distraction and rest, and there's a world of difference between rest and escape. Satan will do everything he can to make you tired and obsessed with fatigue. Following God will make you tired, but Satan will try to make you obsessed with being tired. He will try to make it the issue of your psyche. Man, you are so fatigued. This is just not right. He will offend you with it. Um, uh, so that you indulge in, in escape and distraction. And then that never goes well. It just wears you out even more. Here's a piece of random wisdom. Frustration is not fatigue. Frustration is not fatigue. We have this, this uh, vernacular saying, uh, when we get frustrated with something, we say, I'm tired of X. I'm tired of you doing blankety blank. I'm tired of having to whatever. You're not really tired of it. You're frustrated with it. And so we tend to interpret frustration as fatigue. What's the problem uh, with that? Well, uh, the problem is that if, if you convince yourself that you're actually tired, then it makes you believe that you lack time and energy when really all you need is persistence and faith. You need faith, but you think you, you need a vacation. And that's a deception that Satan is really, really good at. Are you resonating with any of this? Um, so there's one thing. Um, I have made a self-discipline this past year of not saying to God, I'm tired. And the reason I made that self-discipline is because I realized I was telling God I was tired uh, roughly 1,500 times a day. And I thought, you know, maybe I'm overdoing it. Um, and it's just sort of a go-to complaint. What am I really? Well, I'm fatigued, but I'm also frustrated. I also feel lonely. I also feel abandoned. I'm kind of hungry. I'm not getting, um, you know, things that make me feel strong. So let me be clear about what's going on and let me pursue faith instead of just pursuing escape. Uh, and, and I found that really helpful. Uh, number two, uh, rest out of obedience. Not accomplishment. We get into this mind trap where uh, many of us won't rest until we feel like the work is done. We won't rest until we get at a, wait for it, a good stopping point. How many have said that? Um, and that's why God has to come along and say, rest. That's why he has to give commandments, because we're probably not smart enough to find what the good stopping point is. Uh, and also, what rule is that, that we can only rest when the work is, is done? You know, you rest when you rest, and it will help you get the work done. Um, so we have to defeat that mindset. Um, you know, we can say the work isn't done, but it's actually Sabbath time. And that's fine. In the kingdom of God, that's fine, no matter what your boss says. Right? If, you're, if you're a faith-filled person, uh, you will follow the, uh, the commandment. Now, there's a truism here, uh, which I, I use to discipline myself. If you take a perfect Sabbath every week, you're probably sinning. 
because there are a lot of oxes in the ditches that you are not paying attention to. So if every week, religiously, you're getting a perfect Sabbath, you're probably not doing it right. On the same token, if you rarely get a perfect Sabbath, you're probably sinning. And I think that's what Jesus speaks to when he said, hey, Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. You know, do not do this religiously, do this helpfully and lovingly and sensibly. But do it out of obedience, not because you deserve it or because you've come to a good stopping point or because the work is finally done or because you've got a little bit of head ahead now so you can take a break. All of those things are worldly lies. Following me? Rest out of obedience. Take a break. It's the law, people. That's a really useful thing to say, uh, even, even to myself. Have the faith to rest when there is an opportunity. I think when you're a faith-filled kingdom person that a comfortable coil of ropes in the back of a boat during a storm looks like a good opportunity to take a nap. <laughs> and only kingdom people see it that way. Right? It's like, well, the guys are going to row right now. Oh, what a great time to take a nap. Yeah, I, could, I could use one. But that takes a tremendous amount of faith. Um, I, uh, when I, uh, I lived in, in Chicago uh, for seven years, I went there for, for graduate school. It's in a very competitive graduate school program, and, and I was doing a lot of ministry. We ended up helping plant a church there, and I got uh, very worn out. I was very frustrated and disappointed by some things that were happening uh, for, in, in, in my academic career, and I, and I just got savagely depressed. Some old issues from my past came up. I call it the period of my great depression. I got to a point where I was despairing of life. I mean, it was serious depression. I was functional maybe three out of every seven days. Um, you know, a lot of it was circumstantial. A lot of it came from my, the experiences of my past. A lot of it, for me, probably genetic. Depression runs in my family, along with copious amounts of alcoholism and things like that. Um, it struck me hard, and, uh, and it was killing me. It was killing me. And so I... Uh, um, you know, I wrestled, uh, I complained to God a lot is what I did. Uh, and I kind of reached a point of having enough faith to say, well, Lord, what would be helpful here? And, and he gave me through conversation what, what I call my four laws of, of recovering from, uh, from depression. And uh, the first one was, take a Sabbath, stupid, it's the law. Um, there was exercise and eat right. There was don't panic, it'll be better in, in the morning. Um, but, you know, the first one was take, take a Sabbath. It's the law. And it, and it, it invited me to consider what, uh, what constituted real rest because I was depressed, and depressed people don't think or experience life normally. Um, and, and here's what I came up with. And tell me if you resonate with this. The Sabbath is a day when you pretend that everything is okay. That word pretend is the loaded word, right? Because, you know, God is on his throne. Ultimately, we're supposed to believe that everything was all right. But there was no cell in me. There was no fiber in my being that really thought that everything was okay. I couldn't quite buy it, so I just had to exercise it. I just had to pretend. I need to go through the motions that everything is okay. So I set aside, uh, you know, Sundays where I would, I would do no work, I'd do no schoolwork, I would do nothing that, that fatigued me, and I would force myself to celebrate life a little bit, which was very hard for a depressed person to do. I would pretend to be happy. <laughs> I would smile and chuckle. <laughs> very out of character for me. Very out of character for me. My humor is all very dry, sarcastic humor. It's not, it's not laugh out loud sort of humor. Um, but, it, but it, it worked for me because it exercised rest in a way that hit me uh, really powerfully. I survived that and eventually uh, clawed my way out of it. Rest when there is an opportunity. Any way you can, whatever you have to do, and it brings power or healing uh, to your life. Um, most of us need more rest because we don't rest well when we do rest. Right? We're not completely resting when we are at rest, right? The tapes are still running. Uh, we can't 
quite shut down. And that's why we fantasize about escape a lot of times. Jesus slept soundly in the back of the boat. He rested thoroughly. And I think that's a skill that we should probably develop. You might only have 30 minutes in the back of the boat, but you're going to rest for 29 minutes and 59 seconds, and you're going to be snoring. <laughs> you know? Or you might be very depressed. You're going to have afternoon off on Sunday. You are going to celebrate as if everything is okay. You're going to take it to the thorough level. And that's worship, and that's obedience, and that's kingdom living in power uh, right there. Um, finally, follow the lead of the Spirit in your life. Um, we'll just sort of close with this. Um, in the kingdom of God, you rest out of obedience. You rest because God gives it to you to rest. And that means that you have to be following uh, him. And a lot of the most poignant things that scripture says about rest has to do with following the lead of God into rest. Um, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. You know, implication being you don't lie down unless you respect what the Lord is doing in your life. You don't find still waters from which you can drink deeply unless you are following the lead of the Lord. And for most of us, I really think this is where, this is where the money is. This is where the rubber meets the road. I have to ask you, if you feel like you don't have enough rest in your life, well, are you following the Lord's lead? Which means, are you doing the things that God wants you to do? And are you avoiding things that God has not led you to do? That's wisdom. And we need to be rather ruthless about these things. You know. And it doesn't mean every time I encounter an ox in the ditch that I have to pause and discern for 15 minutes whether or not you know, the Lord wants me to lift the ox out. You know, if I encounter a sick person on my day of rest, I, I do my very best to heal them you know, because I have standing orders to heal people. Uh, those are not the sort of things I'm talking about. I'm talking about, really, are you supposed to, well, let's just get real. Are you supposed to have the job you have? Or do you take that job just out of money fear? Um, are, you supposed, are you supposed to be in the program that you're in? Are you supposed to be doing this ministry that you're doing, or has God called you elsewhere? Right. Did you choose that because it was less intense? Because if you chose the really intense thing, you might have more rest. You know, it just depends on where the Lord is leading you. And the Lord will lead you differently than he leads me. You know, he speaks supernaturally. If you're tired... One of the things you really need to do is to sit with the Lord and sit with the discerning prophets and say, and, and do a survey. What am I doing that I shouldn't? What am I not doing that I should? And be ruthless about it. Where the Lord leads you might be surprising, but it will always have rest in it. I'm in a good opportunity for rest uh, right now. Uh, my, my church leaders and church boards have, uh, I, I've had uh, several family crises in, in life recently. I've been traveling a lot, and I get a message from my board. When you come back, you're taking at least three months off, period. Uh, and uh, it's a very busy, busy time. There are a lot of uh, open questions in the church right now. There's a tremendous amount of things going on. Uh, but what they did is that they're following the lead of the Lord. Jordan somehow will make it without you. You're not all that. <laughs> uh, you're gonna, I love having people in my life like that you know, better than gold. And there are a lot of people at this church who will help you discern as well. People who are capable of hearing from the Lord for you. Amen? There's a, a final deeper wisdom here, just, you know, one more line. Uh, and it has to do with my working definition of stamina. I think stamina is the rate of work at which you can rest. So we say that a runner has great stamina if she can run you know, a 530 mile for 20 straight miles. Right? Uh, great marathoners can run a six minute mile and, and feel totally relaxed. The rate at which they can work in rest is just higher than my rate. <laughs> I think really if we move in the Sabbath blessing and the kingdom blessing, one of the hallmarks is we can do incredibly effortful things and not feel stressed or tense about them. 
there's a character of rest in everything that we do, which doesn't mean that, that we're free from taking a day off every once in a while or you know, taking a sabbatical when we need it or making changes in our life uh, if we get uh, kind of worn out. But fear is what fatigues us most of the time. It's anxiety. And fear is the most exclusive virtue in the universe. You can be afraid of God, but you're absolutely disallowed to be afraid of anything else. And even your fear of God is moderated because he loves you like nobody's business. Right? Never stressed. And I think a people who are never stressed are a people who typically find a great deal of stamina. You know, I can work 100 hours a week for 14, 16 months at a time simply because uh, through years of discipleship, the Lord has made me unusually fearless. And the fruit of that is tremendous stamina, right? Tremendously resilient to stress, <laughs> right? Resistant to stress. And that what, that's what makes me a great runner, so to speak. You follow me? So another question you might want to ask yourself is, you know, is stress dominating my life? And what the heck are you stressed about? Whatever it is, it's nonsense. I promise you. Let's pray. Father, I pray that uh, if there are any nuggets of good wisdom uh, today, that you would uh, write them on people's hearts so that they can carry them away and find helpfulness and blessing in them. I pray more to the point, Holy Spirit, that you, uh, the God of all comfort, uh, the Lord of the Sabbath, as Jesus says, would come minister to your people this morning. You have called us to a crazy, effortful, unusual, otherworldly life. Help us to find the otherworldly rest in the midst of it. Give us the faith to rest out of obedience, the faith to see opportunities for rest that normal people wouldn't see, the faith to rest thoroughly without stress and anxiety when we find those opportunities. In the name of Jesus, brothers and sisters, I command you in the name of the Lord who gives the commandment, rest, rest, enter into his rest, be at peace, quiet, be still. That stormy situation in your life, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command it, shut up. Freeze. This is a stress-free zone. We are people of supernatural rest. Some of you just need to uh, curl up in the stern of the tossing boat and take a nap. Some of you need to take the ox out of the ditch but with a smile on your face. Holy Spirit, uh, do the ministry that is so otherworldly. Uh, do the ministry of rest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Song. And, uh, and we'll close with a little ministry time, if that's okay. Uh, we'll do some uh, healing. We'll do some healing. We're just going to go straight into ministry time, so uh, let's do it efficiently. How many of you today have a condition which, if it were immediately healed, you could immediately tell? Go ahead and stand up, provided your condition is not like you have a broken leg or something. So if this were immediately healed, you could immediately tell. Your symptoms would change, or your pain would stop, or flexibility would return, or something like that. All right. Um, those of you who uh, are around them, uh, you just sort of politely stretch out your hand toward them or put a hand on their shoulder. Uh, the ministry team, the prayer team, come up in a second, but let's just start this way. 
Holy Spirit, uh, I pray that you would do your work here on these people. In the name of Jesus, brothers and sisters, uh, I, I bless you with relief from the condition. In the name of Jesus, uh, knee be better. In the name of Jesus, stomach sweeten up. Sweeten up. In the name of Jesus, flexibility return. Move in power, Lord, just because you are gracious. And I, I just declare this a Sabbath zone of rest and restoration. Receive your gift from the Lord. Move, Lord. Just receive what the Lord has given you now. And can I have the prayer team just kind of filter up as we do this? Those of you who are on the Coast Vineyard uh, healing prayer type team. But those of you who are receiving, just receive. Receive. And sort of neck, be better, be free. In Jesus' name. Coming up here, guys. All right, let's check in. Uh, those of you who had conditions, check them out. I just want to know uh, which ones are feeling better. Yeah? What was your problem? Your knee? You were the knee? And what? It's pain-free? Praise God. There's one. Who, who else? The conditions that you check them out or bend over or do what you need to do. Anyone else already? I know that wasn't a long ministry time, but I'm interested. Anyone else feel better? There's a deep knee bend. Yeah, what's back there? I heard, was it back? Oh, cataract. And the cataract cleared up? That's cool. That's nice. Well done. Two of them cleared up? That's that's cool. That's not bad for 60 seconds of work. What was, what was your suit? Is your neck and yeah, I assume more flexibility. Oh, that's nice. I love it when people say stuff like, I can't do this. And then, uh, well, God bless you. That's awesome. Total and complete. Go Lord. Uh, anyone else? Already feel better? All right, that was a quick hit. So look, if you're not completely healed, come on up to these guys and, and they will lay a hand on your shoulder. And uh, by the grace of God, uh, take care uh, of the rest of it. And those of you who have conditions which are more mysterious, we couldn't tell until you went to the doctor that they were healed. You're, you're free to come on up too. Uh, we'll just minister to everything. Uh, and I hope that it is encouraging and restful to you. Uh, God bless you. God bless you in this community. I think this is a kingdom place. This is a community of people who are really really trying to put things in order in Jesus, that they can share that blessed order with the world. So, you know, particularly if you're new, welcome, uh, jump on board. This is one of my favorite places. It will change your life in an otherworldly way. Thanks for having me. I'll see you next time.